Dear viewers, welcome back to this episode of our series on the evolution of fiqh. I start with the name of Allah, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. Today, inshallah, we will be talking about excessiveness versus moderation. Remember last time, last episode, we did have some talk about uh, moderation, and we said that moderation is not <clears throat> uh, necessarily you moderating the religion, it is... Uh, the religion itself being moderate. So if you hold firmly to the moderate religion of Islam, you are on the path of uh, moderation. It's a term that has been misused by a lot of people, and it requires a lot of uh, knowledge and good understanding of the deen to be able to uh, become moderate. Uh, moderation and knowledge are inseparable. The more knowledge you have, the more moderate you'll be. The farther away you'll be from extremism, whether this extremism is to the right side or the left side, because extremism is uh, a characteristic of uh, ignorance. Uh, extremism and ignorance are inseparable as well. And when we talk about extremism, we're not only talking about excessiveness. When we are talking about extremism, we're talking about excessiveness and laxity. Because people who are extreme are not necessarily the people who overdo uh, or try to be uh, very strict in their religion. Uh, the people who also underdo or the people who are lax, uh, the people who uh, are not practicing, they're also extreme. But their extremism is a different type of extremism. There is extremism on the right side and extremism on the left side. Uh, today we will talk about excessiveness, and as we said today, excessiveness does exist, there, there is excessiveness, and <clears throat> even in our day and time, uh, there is uh, excessiveness. It is much less of a problem than the problem of laxity, but it is still a problem, and it is still a big problem, because uh, moderation is the straight path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, we talked about uh, excessiveness uh, uh, briefly yesterday. Today we will mention some of the things that may be considered by some of the people uh, excessiveness, and in fact, uh, they are not excessiveness. One of these things is uh, following the uh, stricter uh, opinion. Uh, in any matter of controversy, you'll have... Uh, people who say it's, this is haram or this is uh, permissible, or people who say this is wajib, this is mustahab, or this is uh, permissible. So to follow the stricter opinion is not excessiveness, because one of these two opinions is correct, and we cannot uh, have a preset conv conviction that the st stricter opinion is always wrong because sometimes the stricter opinion is the right opinion. Sometimes the easier opinion is the right opinion. Well, it depends on the proof from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, from the revelation. The, re the, the injunctions of the religion by their nature are, have some hardship in them because they are injunctions, they are commands and prohibitions. Uh, they are do's and don'ts. And we as human beings are uh, uh, made to feel uh, uh, some resistance or to have some resistance to any injunctions, to any orders or commands. And we have to fight this tendency within us to comply with the revelation and to be after the revelation, we have to fight this resistancy or this temptation to uh, uh, do away with the injunctions, the commands and prohibitions. So the stricter opinion is not uh, necessarily the wrong opinion. Many times it is the right opinion. So this is the first point that I wanted to make clear. A person who follows the stricter opinion in a certain matter or in, in certain matters is not excessive, uh, and uh, his opinion may be the correct opinion versus the other one, which is easier. It is also not excessiveness to stay away from things that are suspicious, to stay away from suspicious matters. When something is either haram or makruh, or it's either haram or permissible, or makruh, disliked, or permissible, and you decide out of piety, 
out of fear from Allah, to stay away from it completely, uh, that is not excessiveness. In fact, that is exactly what the Prophet ﷺ had recommended us to do. That is the way of the Sahaba, Ridwanullahi alayhim, may Allah be pleased with them. They did not only stay away from things that are uh, haram, they did not only stay away from things that are disliked, they stayed away even from things that are permissible out of fear that these things may lead to excessiveness and these things that are permissible may lead them uh, into, follow, into falling in that which is per, uh, not permissible, either haram or makru, uh, prohibited or disliked. The Prophet ﷺ teaches us this concept, the concept of trying to purge our deen from uh, accusations and sins, purge our reputation, our honor from uh, sins and accusations and trying to stay away from matters that are suspicious as much as we can in a hadith <coughs> which was reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim from uh, An-Nu'man ibn Bashir, one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This hadith is one of the great uh, hadith uh, that were collected by Imam al nawawi one of the 40 hadith collected by Imam al nawawi uh, in his book, uh, the 40 uh, hadith. Uh, he felt that these 40 hadith uh, have the essence of the deen. So a correct understanding of the deen is based and founded on these 40 hadith. This hadith that we will talk about now is one of these for the hadith. In this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ tells us, إِنَّ الْحَلَامَ bayin wa inna الْحَرَامَ bayin. Verily, permissible things are clear, and prohibited things are clear as well. وَبَيْنَهُمَا أُمُورٌ مُشْتَبِهَاتٌ And between them are matters that are suspicious. Between them are matters that are suspicious. لَا يَعْلَمُهُنَّ كَثِيرٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ most of the people do not know those matters that are suspicious. فَمَنِ اتَّقَ الشُّبُهَاتِ اسْتَبْرَأَ لِدِينِهِ وَعِرْضِهِ So he who stays away from the suspicious matters had purged his religion and his reputation from sins and accusations. وَمَنْ وَقَعَ فِي الشُّبُهَاتِ وَقَعَ فِي الْحَرَامِ And he who falls into suspicious matters will certainly fall into matters that are clearly prohibited. It's like a shepherd who's grazing his sheep around the private property. He's very close to the private property. He's not staying away. It's a private property of a king, a private property of someone who is very influential, very uh, powerful. And this shepherd is reckless because he is grazing his sheep very close to the line of the private property. He keeps on saying, well, I did not uh, uh, tr trespass or transgress the line yet. I did not violate the line yet. But the sheep are all around the line. The sheep will, will certainly, without a doubt, uh, transgress this line and violate it. Your soul is like the sheep. If you stay very close to the area that is prohibited, the sacred zone of Allah, the area of the prohibitions, if you stay very close to that area of prohibitions, then you are subjecting yourself to uh, falling into the sacred zone of Allah. In other words, to make it a little easier, if you do not uh, lower your gaze, y you are likely to progress and to have friendships with uh, the other gender and then to fall into the clear haram. Uh, it's steps. The shaitan takes us through steps and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to stay away from the steps of the shaitan. Stay very far from the steps of the shaitan. Stay far from the line of the pro Allah's property, Allah's sacred zone. Do not violate it because when you violate a sacred zone of a king, you know, the, the, the results, the consequences are certainly bad, but when you violate the sacred zone of Allah, the consequences could be eternity and uh, the hellfire. Karai, like a shepherd who's grazing his sheep around the private property, he's about to violate it. He's about to violate it. 
And then the Prophet وسلم, said to us, Ala وَإِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ مُضْغَى Certainly there is a piece of flesh in the body. إِذَا صَلَحَتْ If it is rectified, صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ The whole body is rectified. وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ And if it is corrupted, the whole body will be corrupted. أَلَا وَهِيَ الْقَلْبِ Certainly this is the heart. This is the heart. What is the Prophet trying to tell us here? This talk is about rulings. It's about suspicious matters. He's trying to tell us that you should ask your heart. Whatever you're comfortable with, do it. Whatever your heart is not comfortable with, do not do it. Whatever you feel may have a negative impact on your relationship with Allah, on Allah's uh, love for you, on your love for Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you stay away from it. Sometimes these matters are not uh, decided only by the mind, even though we should use our minds, but they are decided by the heart as well. So ask your heart. And that's the, the meaning of another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu in which he said, استفتي قلبك, ask your heart. So now this is the second point. The first point is that to take the stricter opinion when there is a controversy is not excessiveness. The second point is that it is not excessiveness to try to stay away from suspicious matters as much as uh, you can. And this is the prescription of our beloved Prophet wasallam, And this is the way of the uh, beloved companions of the Prophet. So now, if this is not excessiveness, it's not excessiveness to, to take the stricter opinion, it is not excessiveness to stay away from suspicious matters, what is excessiveness? Does it exist? It does exist. And excessiveness could be to always take the stricter opinion, just because it is the stricter opinion. You know, you take the stricter opinion because you feel it is, it is what Allah wants of you. Uh, but in, in, in every controversy, uh, there, there are various opinions. There are some that are easier, some that are stricter. So if you consistently, persistently take the stricter opinion, just because it's the stricter opinion, then that is excessiveness. And that is not the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, it is also excessiveness to take the uh, stricter opinion and not only abide by it yourself uh, but to impose it on other people that is excessiveness if you want to take the stricter opinion and abide by it that's okay you can do that but if you impose it on other people then that is excessiveness certainly not every disagreement is an acceptable disagreement there are matters that uh, are agreed upon by the scholars of Islam and regarding these matters we should not disagree. But sometimes, the, or many times, there are disagreements that are acceptable. To, uh, the uh, areas uh, within which disagreement is acceptable and permissible. And regarding these matters, you should not impose your own opinion on uh, others. It is also excessive to consistently forego the concessions given to us by Allah. Allah gives us a lot of concessions. Allah intends for you ease, and He does not intend for you hardship. So Allah wants ease for us. And when Allah gives us a concession, to forego the concessions of Allah is certainly excessive. We will come back after the break and talk about uh, excessiveness, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about excessiveness, and we said that excessiveness is not to stay away from suspicious matters, nor is it to uh, take the stricter opinion in some matters, in uh, some matters of the religion. Excessiveness, as we indicated earlier, is to always take the stricter opinion, just because it is the stricter opinion, is to impose the stricter opinion on people in matters in, uh, about which disagreement is acceptable. Uh, strictness is to also, as we said, forego the concessions given to us by Allah. In, in many uh, matters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given us concessions because Allah is most merciful and Allah 
is uh, Allah wants our uh, own benefit and wants to make the religion easy and the practice of the religion easy for us. So for instance, a traveler can shorten the prayers. A traveler may break his fast in Ramadan. If someone said, I will never shorten the prayers, uh, whether residing or traveling, that is excessiveness because that is contrary to what Allah wants uh, from us and wants for us. Now the, the other uh, indication of excessiveness uh, that some people fall in uh, sometimes is to uh, make haram that which Allah has not made haram is to uh, f fabricate against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to lie against Allah and make things haram where Allah has not made them haram this is certainly the ultimate in excessiveness this is the ultimate in excessiveness this is a major sin and we should never fabricate lies against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَا تَصِفُوا أَلْسِنَتُكُمْ الْكَذِبَ هَذَا حَلَالُ وَهَذَا حَرَامُ And do not say to, uh, to that which your tongues utter or talk about, to that which your tongues speak about, this is halal and this is haram. لِتَفْتَرُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ So that you fabricate lies against Allah. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَفْتَرُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبِ لَا يُفْلِحُونَ Verily, those who fabricate lies against Allah will never prosper. Those who fabricate lies against Allah will never prosper. So, excessiveness, briefly, is to follow the stricter opinion because it's the stricter opinion all the time, impose it on others, consistently forego the concessions given to us by Allah, and certainly... Uh, to uh, make haram that which Allah has not made haram. Now we will move on to a different topic, which is uh, some helpful tips from the uh, topic or the science of the fundamentals of jurisprudence and the science of the legal principles on uh, the uh, issue of fiqh. These, sci these different types of science uh, are to an extent specialized, but certainly some knowledge in the area of the fundamentals of jurisprudence, usul al-fiqh, and the legal principles, al-qawa'ad al-fiqhiyya, will benefit us and will pave the route for us to a better understanding of the religion in general and to fiqh, or the knowledge of the detailed uh, religious rulings from their detailed scriptural evidence. We will start by some of the uh, legal principles that would help us in our understanding of fiqh and our practice of uh, the religion in general. The first legal principle, and these legal principles that I'll mention now are called major and comprehensive. Comprehensive because they are applicable to all or most of the topics of fiqh and major, and major because they have great applications and extensive applications and many other uh, principles lie underneath them. The first one is deeds are but by their intentions. <inaudible> and that's the beginning of one of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ one of the hadith that Imam al-Nawi considered to be the basis, the foundation of correct understanding of this uh, deen, the for the hadith. إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ The scholars took this and they modified it a little bit. Some scholars used it as such. They say إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Other scholars say الْأُمُورُ بِالْمَقَاصِدِهَا Eventually when you translate both it will become the same thing. Uh, verily, deeds are but by their intentions. Deeds are but by their intentions. It is quite important for us to understand this particular principle because this is about sincerity. And we know that for the uh, acceptance of our deeds, we have to fulfill two conditions. Sincerity for Allah and correctness. The action must be for Allah and for Allah alone and must be correct 
meaning upon the path of Allah, the straight path uh, in conformity with the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first of these conditions is sincerity. And this legal principle, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَلُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Verily, deeds are by their intentions, is to emphasize this point. So what you do uh, is contingent upon, or the consequences of what you do in this life and in the hereafter are contingent upon your intention. Uh, let's say you dispute over a matter and you take your, the other party to the judge and the judge rules for you. This does not mean that you, uh, in case you were not the, uh, you were the wrongdoer, if you were the wrongdoer and the party rules or the judge rules for you, that does not mean that you're the right uh, one and your, your friend is wrong. It, it just means that the judge ruled for you. But your intention in your action is known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It may not be known by the judge. It may not be known by the people. In, in writing contracts, in writing contracts, when you stipulate some condition, your intention when you stipulate this condition and the intention of the other party as well is what matters uh, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not the linguistic meaning uh, per se. The linguistic meaning of the, the condition will matter to the judge because the judge have no power to see into your heart or to look into your heart. So he will take uh, the, the clauses of the contract and try to understand them uh, within the context of the language and he will rule for you or against you based on his understanding of the language. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows uh, you, what's in your heart, knows your intention and the intentions of the other party. So be aware of this. The other principle which is very important in understanding our deen and understanding the fiqh or the knowledge of the rulings is that certainty is not negated by doubt. <clears throat> certainty is not negated by doubt. How do we uh, implement this uh, principle in, in, in fiqh in general? I'll just give you an example to make the principle clear to you. If you have wudu uh, after dhuhr or before dhuhr, and uh, a few hours later, you forget whether you broke your wudu or not. Maybe you had wudu at 2 o'clock, you're quite sure that you had wudu at 2 o'clock, <clears throat> and then you left uh, for work, and at work you forget whether you use the bathroom or not, whether you broke your wudu or not, what should be the ruling here? Do you still have wudu or do you not have wudu? Well, you do have wudu because you're sure that you had wudu. What you're not sure of is whether you broke your wudu or not. So you should consider yourself as having wudu. Because the, what you're certain of is that you did have wudu at 2 o'clock, but you have doubts whether you broke your wudu later on or not. You can uh, reverse this, uh, the, the, this principle, you can, or you can reverse this example. Let's say you are quite sure that you used the bathroom at 2 o'clock, but you have some doubts whether you had wudu afterwards or you did not have wudu afterwards. In this case, you do not have wudu because you're certain that you broke your wudu and you have some doubts whether you um, uh, renewed or you, had, you made wudu or did not uh, make wudu. Now, the third legal principle that is of uh, uh, also benefit for, for all of us, uh, even though we will not be using it on our own, we will not be using it in our own. This legal principle uh, is used by the scholars, by the muftis. Uh, it says, al tu tajlibu taysir which means uh, hardship must bring about easing or ease. It, it means that when things get to be too hard, the mufti or the scholar who's uh, uh, being asked must uh, 
make some concessions because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not wa- want us to suffer from hardship. This is a little tricky issue because hardship is relative. Hardship is relative. Therefore, it is not the individual who will decide whether this hardship uh, that he's going through is a true hardship. It is, a, it is considered by the religion to be out of the ordinary hardship. Some people may think that waking up in the morning at 5 o'clock for the Fajr prayer is a hardship. Some people may think that making wudu uh, to, for the prayer uh, early in the morning is a hardship. Uh, it, it, is, it is certainly uh, a type of hardship, but it is not out of the ordinary. It is not unbearable hardship. It is a hardship, but it is a hardship that Allah wants us to do. It's, a, it's, it's something that Allah still requires of us. Why? Because it is not out of the ordinary and it is not unbearable. So the assessment of the degree of hardship is not for the individual, because had it been for the individual, everyone will tailor a religion for his own, for his own liking. Everyone will say, well, this is hard, this is okay, I can do this, I cannot do that. And then people will be tailoring hundreds or actually thousands or millions of religions. There will not be one religion anymore. Everyone will have his own. But this matter of deciding what hardship uh, uh, results in uh, the the, uh, ruling being eased out or should result in some loosening of uh, the ruling should be the scholars. The scholars and only the scholars are the ones to decide upon these matters. And and not not all the scholars, by the way. The the scholars who are well grounded in the knowledge of Islam. And based on the size of the issue as well. If it is a, if it is a huge issue, if it is a huge issue that is afflicting the whole ummah, then the, 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 the greatest of the scholars are the ones who should decide upon this issue. We should always refer back to الرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ as Allah has indicated in the Qur'an. الرَّاسِخُونَ فِي الْعِلْمِ means the ones who are well-grounded in knowledge. The ones who are well-grounded in knowledge. So uh, this, this is uh, one of the beauties of Islam, this particular principle, legal principle, is one of the beauties of Islam. If we do not misuse it, it will be of great benefit for us as individuals and for uh, the community. Uh, It also uh, shows us the flexibility and malleability of this religion and suitability of the religion for all times. And when we come back, we will be talking about the last two legal principles and that's in the next episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.